All righty, good afternoon, or I should say good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Wayne Theater. Um, I am Joe Kuiper, director of the Virginia Museum of Natural History, and I want to thank the Wayne Theater for hosting our lecture series now for several years in a row. Uh, this has been a great collaborative, a lot of great talks, a lot of great information about the Shenandoah Valley, the Blue Ridge, and all the science that is involved with it. So it's been a great pleasure to have this collaborative opportunity. First of all, I want to thank the South River Science Team for being our sponsor, and also for the local nonprofit. Uh, the Center for Cold Waters Restoration has just been a huge supporter of the Virginia Museum of Natural History for so many years, and most importantly, with our effort to establish the first permanent branch of the museum, and we have chosen Waynesboro for so many reasons, I mean, logistically because of the great uh, proximity to some urban areas as well as Shenandoah National Park and the Blue Ridge Parkway and the audiences that are there, but also because there are just so, so many great stories in natural history and the natural sciences that can be told here, great place-based opportunities. And uh, I also want to thank the city of Waynesboro, who uh, listened to me with very polite smiles about seven, eight, nine years ago. I can't remember how long ago now. And I thought, oh, they must think I'm crazy. But no, they have finally, you know, eventually buy in and they, they get the idea and they have just worked with the General Assembly, who's been very supportive of the museum. And as of December of last year, uh, we completed what the state calls our pre-planning study, which is uh, what you do before you go into your detailed plans. And uh, we are all set to do de detailed plans. Being a capital project, like all Virginia capital projects are, it's basically on hold until we get to a point that we have the current pandemic behind us. So I think we're using the terms that everybody else, including the Wayne Theater and you and everyone else is using, that is agility and patience during this time. So once we get past this point in our history, we're ready to dive into detailed planning. And that's a regimented process that gets us uh, to the point where we develop the design drawings that go to a contractor that actually starts to bring heavy equipment in and uh, establish our uh, building here. So uh, the Board of Trustees and our Foundation Board of Directors have been working so hard on this for a long time now, and it's uh, great to see that progress, and uh, we look forward to making uh, further progress. Tonight, though, I uh, have my wonderful colleague, uh, Dr. Nancy Moncrief, who will be bringing up in a moment here, she is our curator of mammals and has been at the museum uh, for a good long while now. Uh, and uh, she's seen a lot of the museum's history from its humble beginnings in a renovated school building that uh, it had its start in the 1980s. I think you started in the 1990s, Nancy. And then uh, eventually moved to a new building that the state built for us in 2007 to store the uh, 10 plus million specimens and artifacts that we have inventoried in our collection and uh, now up to this point where we're looking to have our first permanent branch. We've had borrowed branches in the past at universities, uh, but that of course is something that, um, you know, you, we don't have full control over. So it's nice to be able to work uh, towards this opportunity to have a permanent branch. So tonight, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is, uh, first of all, to put everything into perspective for the lecture series for this year. So back in September, I gave an overview of our exhibits, some of the really great stories that we could tell, the place-based stories from the Shenandoah Valley, the Blue Ridge and surrounding areas, and how they interact with other areas of Virginia, such as Northern Virginia and other uh, portions of uh, the Commonwealth. So after I went through that, we brought in Dr. Adam Pritchard, our paleontologist, and he talked about the stories of ancient life in Virginia. And we began to hopefully anyway show you, show all our audiences that we are the right institution to do this because we've got the in-house expertise to talk about the natural heritage of Virginia. So tonight, Dr. Moncrief is going to talk to us about speciation and how there's some wonderful speciation stories that occur right here in the Commonwealth. And so she's going to rely upon her expertise as a zoologist. And so uh, what we have here, first of all, all these different partners that we have that uh, helped us get to this point. Here's an image of uh, the exterior uh, of our building. Again, then this is our pre-planning study, so a lot of the details will change over time. This is an evolving process, but it's still exciting to see this. This is Constitution Park. The South River is on the... Um, would be flowing right around here in this image here. So, and then we have uh, Main Street and Arch Avenue right here. So uh, that's our location, but uh, certainly this uh, design will uh, change over time. But this gives us a general idea of what things will look like in upcoming years. 
And so here we are on Starling Avenue in Martinsville. This is our building uh, that we run right now there. Uh, we want to take everything we've learned over time and improve upon that because this is a very conventional building. We want to build a building that really uh, helps with the whole concept of climate change and, um, uh, you know, making sure that we are energy efficient and that we blend into the environment very well. So uh, we're very proud of what we've done here, but we know we've learned a lot. We want to apply that up here. As far as the exhibits go, we've got a lot of experience and people like Nancy, our other curators, our educators have put in some brilliant exhibitry uh, within our building. So this shows you some of the quality that we have established uh, there in our Starling Avenue facility. It's Big Al, the Allosaurus right there. And incidentally, um, just as a, a little humorous aside here, uh, you see this big thing right here. I, I used to try to make the kids laugh a little bit by telling them that was a petrified Allosaurus hairball, right? But it's not. It's actually what we call a stromatolite. This is actually, to our knowledge, this is the world's largest intact cap of a stromatolite that we got from Bedford County, Virginia. Stromatolites are these mushroom-shaped kind of colonies of algae, technically blue-green algae or cyanobacteria, that grow in shallow oceans. And this particular specimen is about 500 million years old. Stromatolites occur today, but only in the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. So that is uh, something that we're very proud of, um, even though we also like to make a a little bit of fun with it. It's all good. So we have some great exhibits and we want to bring this experience up here to Waynesboro. So here we got a different view of the building, kind of you ro rolling up towards the front entrance of uh, the Virginia Museum of Natural History Waynesboro campus. Um, oops, hang on here. And uh, this is uh, kind of shows, you know, some of the, the layout of uh, one of our galleries here. So Adam, Dr. Pritchard last month talked about some of the stories of ancient life, which we'll kind of cover in this wing of the building here. Zoology gets stretched out in a couple different areas of the museum, but uh, we've got some great uh, ideas of how to kind of fill that uh, gallery in with great stories of uh, regional zoology, right? And uh, so this is something, a couple of very basic concepts that we were talking about, just a couple of quick things here. One, biodiversity, you're going to hear about that tonight. You're going to be hearing about some of the mechanisms of speciation which lead to areas of high, what we call endemism, or the idea that you have species that live only in a very small area. So we're going to be celebrating that here. We're going to be celebrating, again, the local story. Speaking of local stories, this is something that we can talk about as you drive along 81 or 64 uh, and you look up on the mountainsides and you see these kind of gray areas that look like, uh, we call them talus slopes or scree slopes. Those are naturally occurring and persistent and are ecosystems that are extremely selective. They're tough ecosystems to live in, but we find unique flora and fauna that live there, and our experts like Dr. Moncrief will be bringing those stories here to VMNH Waynesboro. So without further ado, I want to bring up our curator of mammals, Dr. Nancy Moncrief, who's going to be talking about mountaintop treasures. So let's give a warm welcome for Dr. Moncrief. I'm going to run you off the other end of the stage. Oh, that's not Okay, so, so I'll do a little mic check. Is this, is this an okay volume? And can everybody hear? You can't hear. There's one person here. Do I need, just need to talk louder? Can you hear now? Okay. Okay, so um, this slide has a salamander on it, which is actually one of our mountaintop treasures. So I'll just jump right in. So this is a heat map of biodiversity in the United States. And in this case, heat is not referring to the air temperature, but it's referring to the number, uh, a high concentration of species and often unique species. So the more red or yellow you see on this map, the more species in that place. And here we are in Western Virginia and the Southern Appalachians. Um, is the biggest hotspot for biodiversity in the eastern U.S. And looking at some of the reasons for that, when we kind of zoom in on uh, Western Virginia here, we see that there's lots of unique places for organisms to live. There's a high concentration of rivers. We have quite varied terrain, long, broad ridges and steep slopes that are separated by deep gorges and wide intermountain valleys. 
Another key factor is that there's been long periods of relatively little geologic activity, geologic disruption, so there's been a long time for life to evolve and adapt to local conditions. So when you add that up, you get higher biodiversity. Uh, tonight I'll be mostly be talking about uh, land-dwelling organisms, but there's quite high aquatic freshwater diversity in this region. And again, it's because of the high concentration of rivers, varied terrain, and the long, long relatively ge geologically inactive time for life to evolve here. So one of the groups of animals that is highly diverse in the Appalachians is salamanders. And one genus, one kind in particular, these woodland salamanders. So there's 55 species in the world. All of them are here in North America. 45 of them occur in the eastern U.S. And 20 of them are here in Virginia. Here are all woodland salamanders. Um, and these are some of the species that occur in the western part of the state. Believe it or not, this is the most abundant vertebrate predator in the eastern hardwood forests. But they're quite inconspicuous, and you've probably never seen one unless you go out looking for them. Uh, there's a salamander in this illustration. Can you see it? There he is right in the middle. <laughs> so even in illustrations, these things are quite inconspicuous. Uh, one of the reasons that they are seldom seen, okay, on the left is a photo that shows two adults in somebody's hands. Many of these species, as full adults, uh, only get to be about two and a half to seven inches long. So these animals are ectothermic or cold-blooded. So unlike us, mammals and birds, which are endothermic, we... Uh, generate our own internal body temperature. We burn energy to hold our temp body temperature at a con relatively constant rate. Ectotherms, amphibians like these uh, salamanders, reptiles, and fish, regulate their body temperature a lot of times with behavior. They move to a warmer or a cooler place in order to maintain uh, the body temperature that they uh, want to, so to speak. Because they're so small, they overheat easily. And another unusual feature of these woodland salamanders is they don't have lungs. They breathe, they literally breathe through their skin. So a combination of being small and breathing through their skin means they have to stay in cool, moist conditions. Because of that, they're mostly active at night, and they're mostly active during the spring and fall. So again, they're not easily seen. Uh, they stay underground a lot of time in their own burrows, in burrows of other animals, and in crevices between rocks. When they do come above ground, a lot of times they stay under leaf litter, and they're most active on rainy nights in the woods, so most people are not out on rainy nights in the woods. Um, they're active April through October, but not in the heat of the summer. <laughs> and they're not active in winter at all because they are ectotherms, so they, they go below the frost line to hibernate. And again, they're quite inconspicuous. The adults, uh, some of these species are only three inches long. They're brownish or grayish and they don't make noise. A lot of small, we've got a lot of small birds, but they're pretty noisy and easy to uh, notice. So here's another food web with our woodland salamander right here in the middle. So these guys eat lots of insects and other invertebrates. And in fact, this is the top predator in forest ecosystems for insects and other invertebrates, mostly ones that in insects that are involved in decomposition of leaf litter. So these are really crucial elements of our forest ecosystem. 
things that eat salamanders, um, some reptiles, and uh, medium, kind of medium-sized mammals, birds that feed on the ground. But the two most important predators for these guys are small mammals called shrews and a few species of snakes. So coming back to our woodland salamanders they'll be, that live in Virginia, there's 20, of, 20 species that live in the state. Some of them occur statewide and some of them are localized to very specific places in the west at high elevations. Uh, there are six species, These are, this is distribution of six species that are found only at high elevations and believe it or not there are six different dots on that map, or there's more than six, but six different colors. There are three that are extremely localized here in western Virginia. And just to give you a point of reference, here is Waynesboro, Martinsville, the headquarters of the Virginia Museum of Natural History is there in south central Virginia. So the first salamander of the evening is the Shenandoah salamander. It's only found in a few places in Madison and Page in Shenandoah National Park. Uh, very habitat specific, above 2,900 feet on those three mountains in pockets of moist soil on north facing scree slopes. And if you're like me, you haven't heard much about scree uh, before you kind of got into some of this. So, uh, the geologic term is talus or scree. My non-technical uh, term for it is pile of rocks. <laughs> um, as I understand it, a, if the rocks are kind of larger, it's talus, and if they're smaller, it's scree. And what this is, is the result of weathering and erosion on these cliff faces and the rocks peel off and roll down the hill and you get a pile. And this is what it looks like when there's no vegetation on it. Some of these never get vegetation on them. Some parts of them never get vegetation on them because it's just an unfriendly environment for uh, plants to grow. Some of them eventually do get vegetation and grassland and there are some, uh, let's see if I can figure out how to, oh. so there are some big rocks up in here. So this is habitat for Shenandoah salamanders with, um, as you can see, grassland, some grasses and forest. And um, they, the salamanders take advantage of those rocks and use them to help burrow into exactly the right uh, moisture and temperature in the soil. And uh, the unvegetated talus, this is what Joe was referring to, if, you, you, if you've driven on 81 or 64 down the Blue Ridge Parkway, these, uh, these exposed rocky talus things are um, where salaman the, the salamanders live in the vegetated areas. Next up is the big level salamander found only in Augusta County at around 900 to 3,500 feet elevation. Again, they require deep moist soil and mature hardwoods, and they're found, only found in areas that get quite a bit of rainfall. Next is the Peaks of Otter Salamander from Bedford and Botetot. Above 1,800 feet elevation, a 10-mile stretch of the Blue Ridge Mountains in those two counties. Again, deep moist soil and in mature hardwoods. And again, these guys live in this rocky habitat and they use the rocks to help them burrow to the right depth. So these three species are found nowhere else on Earth. They're only in these mountains uh, right here uh, literally within a couple hours drive of Waynesboro. And as I mentioned before, some of the um, 
there are several species that are much more widespread. So the eastern, uh, sorry, eastern redback salamander occurs basically throughout Virginia. And those three that I just talked about, the high elevation ones, further down the mountain are eastern redback salamanders in each one of those locations. So there are salamanders throughout the, the wooded areas, but the species differ and the high elevation ones are isolated in very specific regions. So why are there so many species of salamanders and other animals and plants here in Western Virginia? And how, to answer that question, we have to answer how do species form or how do species arise? So uh, the rest of the talk I'll be giving a general background about evolution and talk about the role of DNA in evolution and then zero in on one mechanism of evolution. And then we'll talk about how species form. And then I'll give you a couple of scenarios for Western Virginia using these salamanders as an example. So tonight I'll show how we go from here, which is a family tree of parents at the bottom then children and grandchildren to here, which is an evolutionary tree of salamanders. So biological evolution is descent with modification. So starting off with a hypothetical example of three beetles, two of them are green and one of them is brown here in generation one. By generation six, we have equal numbers of green and brown. By generation 15, almost all are brown. And generation 25, all the beetles are brown. So we've had change through time from generation one to generation 25. And the color of beetles in generation 25 is a result of descent with modification from generation one. So evolution, biological evolution, requires traits that are variable and heritable. So here are some cartoons of two people with variable traits. Trait one is the size of the nose, and trait two is fullness of eyebrows. So the man has a bigger nose and normal eyebrows. The woman has a smaller nose and bushy eyebrows. If these two people become parents, the offspring unfortunately gets the big nose of the father and the bushy eyebrows of the mother. Role of DNA in evolution. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. So this is a key molecule that directs development, functioning, and reproduction in organisms. And it interacts with the environment to determine what organisms look like, how they behave, and what their physiology is. It's a molecule that codes for traits that are variable and heritable. And it's inherited from one generation to the next. So the father has sperm with DNA in it. The mother has an egg with DNA in it. Those two gametes, sperm and egg, unite to form an offspring. Evolution is change in allele frequencies of genes within a population over time. So evolution is change over time, but the things that are changing are allele frequencies of genes within a population. I'm going to define those. What's a gene? So there are bodies in most cells inside the nucleus called chromosomes. And a chromosome is protein, a combination of protein and DNA. And a gene is a segment of DNA that is responsible for a particular trait. And alleles are different variants of genes, different variants of DNA sequence. So in the beetle example, there's a color gene in these beetles and there are two alleles, one for brown and one for green. 
And in the example I gave before, the frequency of brown alleles went from 33%, one in three, in generation one, to 100% in generation 25. Oops. Where do alleles come from? Where does genetic variation come from? Well, the ultimate source is mutations. When a cell divides and makes a copy of its DNA, sometimes the copy is not perfect and there is a mutation. But the only important mutations for evolution are those that occur during DNA replication to produce eggs and sperm. That DNA is what is passed to the next generation. So here's a schematic of cell division, eggs and sperm, so you start with a parent cell on the top and you end up with four daughter cells, four eggs or four sperm, depending on what sex you are. Mutations at that second stage are passed to offspring and subsequent generations. That's when DNA replication is occurring during production of eggs and sperm. So we go back to the cartoons of the father and the mother uh, the sperm has 23 chromosomes, the egg has 23 chromosomes. The DNA from the mother and father together give you the 46 chromosomes, which is the normal complement for uh, humans. Alleles are different versions of a gene, and mutations during DNA replication to produce eggs and sperm are what is passed to subsequent generations. So here's going back to a beetle example. There's no mutations in DNA replication in the mother or the father, and there's no variation. There's only green alleles. The mother has two green alleles. She gives one of those to the offspring. The father has two green alleles. He gives one to the offspring. So the offspring gets only green alleles, and it's green. If a mutation in DNA replication during sperm production occurs, in this example, it makes a brown allele. And so the mother gave, it, gave one of her green alleles to the offspring. In this case, the offspring inherits, inherits the brown allele from the father, and so the offspring is brown. Mechanisms of evolution. So again, evolution is change in allele frequencies through time but what mechanism causes changes in allele frequencies? So going back to our beetle example where we have 33% brown in generation one and 100% brown in generation 25, what happened in the intervening generations? Well, in this example, we've had natural selection. The green beetles are more obvious on a brown bark background, and those are the ones that are targeted by birds and eaten before they can reproduce. The brown beetles are less obvious, so more of them survive to reproduce. And differential reproduction causes an increase in the frequency of brown alleles over time. So this was Charles Darwin's big idea. He wrote the book, Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And at the time, uh, breeding pigeons in England was a big thing. And so what Darwin realized was that you can start with one kind of pigeon and select very different looking pigeons over successive generations and end up with a very different, with three very different looking breeds of pigeons. So starting with our wild rock pigeon, selecting them over generations for particular traits that you wanted, that people wanted to emphasize, and end up with three very different breeds from the same ancestral uh, wild pigeon. And that's called artificial selection. When Darwin got to the Galapagos Islands and saw these six different finches with very different shapes and sizes of beaks, 
he realized that a similar process had occurred and that an ancestral finch had colonized the Galapagos and over time successive uh, generations had changed to give us the six species on the right and he called that natural selection. So natural selection changes allele frequencies through time and going to an example now where instead of using beetles I'm going to put different colored uh, dots in a box. So that first generation is now one-third brown dots and two-thirds green dots. Generation six is half and half. Generation 15 is almost all brown dots, th but there's 12 dots in every box. And generation 25 is 100% uh, brown dots. How do species form? So until now, I've been showing you examples of changes in allele frequencies through time, but in only a single population. So now I'll go through a series of slides and consider change in allele frequencies through time and space. Uh, up at the left, upper left, there's a time clock counting the number of generations in this example. So we're starting here at G1 or generation one. And I've got five boxes, five populations with only blue alleles to start. So here we are in generation one and animals can move freely around among these populations and free re reproduction can occur among all populations. So alleles can move among all populations, but we can't tell that they're moving because we only have blue alleles so far. By generation 10, a river changes course, and in this case, the river is a barrier to movement and reproduction of the animals and the alleles. The alleles can't move across, the animals can't move across the river, and the alleles can't move. The two Populations on the left can freely move and reproduce. The three on the right can freely move, uh, reproduce, but left and right cannot move and reproduce with each other. By generation 50, we have a mutation up there in that top right-hand box, and we have a red allele arise. By generation 100, this river is still in place preventing movement and reproduction of animals and movement of alleles. And the frequency of the red allele is increasing by selection, but it's only increasing on the right because it can't get across the river. A lot more time passes. The river is still a barrier. And by, the, by generation 1000, we only have red alleles on the right and only blue alleles on the left. By generation 1200, a lot more time has passed and the river changes course again, so there is no river separating these populations now, but we still only have blue on the left and red on the right. And at this point, even without a physical barrier, blue cannot mate and reproduce with red because they are now reproductively isolated and this is this is the origin of species, when groups of population cannot mate with each other and produce fertile offspring. So at this point, blue and red are separate evolutionary lineages. And they can't share mutations. This is really the, really the important point of speciation is after this point, groups of populations can't share new mutations with each other. So if we keep our generation time clock ticking, and now we're up to generation 1300, now in the blue, uh, on the, in the two blue populations, we've had a mutation from blue to magenta, and in the three right-hand populations, the, we've got a mutation of red to green. And importantly, 
those two mutations cannot be shared between species because there's reproductive isolation. By a generation 1400, magenta is increasing on the left and green is increasing on the right. And by generation 2000, we only have magenta on the left and we only have green on the right. So uh, representing that sequence of allele frequency change in a slightly different way, we start with our box of only blue alleles. We have speciation to blue on the top and red on the bottom. And blue goes to magenta and red goes to green because they're separate evolutionary lineages and they cannot share magenta and green alleles with each other. So the example I just gave a river is a barrier to animals that live on land. A land mass can be a barrier to animals that live in water. A forest is a barrier for animals that live in grasslands. And a grassland can be a barrier to animals that live in forests. Scenarios for Western Virginia. So why are there so many species of woodland salamanders? And to answer that question, we have to think about past environments and what was eastern North America like in the past. So during the Pliocene, which was about five and a half to two and a half million years ago, we know there were long dry periods during that time period. And during those dry conditions, Grasslands spread throughout eastern North America at lower elevations. So we think that the valleys in eastern North America looked a lot like today's African savannas. So if that's what the valleys were like, what were the, what, that's where the grasslands were like. Where were the Appalachian forests and the woodland salamanders and other organisms that lived in those forests? Where were those during the Pliocene? Okay, so now I'm going to show you some schematics of sort of a cross-section through the landscape. And in dry conditions during the Pliocene, forests were only on the wetter mountaintops and grasslands were only in the drier valleys. And to help you see that better, so I have a schematic that shows two, two mountaintops with forest on them and a valley that has grassland in it. Under wet conditions, the forests are everywhere, all over the mountains and on the valley floor. And another way of showing the distribution of forests under the, in these wet conditions is a satellite view looking down. So there's continuous forest cover throughout the landscape. Under dry conditions, if the forests are only on the mountaintops and there's grassland in the valley, under the satellite view, you have two fragmented forests and a grassland acting as a barrier between those forests. So the grassland, remember, is a barrier to movement and reproduction by animals that live in forests. So if we have a hypothetical situation where we go from wetter conditions, continuous forest, to drier conditions, fragmented forests, and put, that, put our populations of uh, salamanders in there, so we have continuous blue alleles in a single population, fragmentation of the forest by grasslands during a dry period so that um, we have speciation of red on the right and blue on the left. And if that dry period persists long enough, we could have blue going to magenta on the left and red going to green on the right. So if we put our salamanders in, we go from a blue ancestral salamander to blue on the top, red on the bottom. So this is origin of species or a speciation event. 
and blue goes to magenta and red goes to green. They don't share alleles at all. They're on separate evolutionary trajectories. And uh, another way of showing that same tree is like this, where I've put all the boxes of alleles in the same position. And a simplified version of showing that tree is this. So this tree actually has all the information content I just showed you with all those boxes with colored dots in them. Um, but this is the simple way of drawing the same tree. And we know there were more than two spe there, there are more than two species of salamanders in Western Virginia. Um, that was a simplified example that I just showed. So the sequence of speciation events had to have been more complicated than what I just showed you, but all of the same mechanisms and the same concepts apply. And this, in fact, is um, a speciate, uh, uh, evolutionary tree of a lot of the species here in Western Virginia produced by a study by Richard Hyten. Big level salamander, one of our mountaintop treasures, is there on the top with an asterisk by him. And about in the middle is the Peaks of Otter salamander. Hyten did not include Shenandoah salamanders in this study, so I can't show you where, where they fall out on that tree. Remember, too, at the same time in Western Virginia, besides these salamanders, there were many other animals and plants uh, on the landscape and in the water. So evolution and speciation uh, was occurring throughout the landscape. And that's why we're a hot spot for biodiversity. And again, remember the, the root cause, the, um, Underlying reasons for this is the high concentration of rivers and the varied terrain and the long time for evolution and speciation and for these populations to become isolated the way they have. So that's how we go from here, a family tree, to here, an evolutionary tree of salamanders. And family trees are short-term changes over a few generations. Speciation, like I showed you, uh, usually uh, uh, takes quite a few generations and it's longer term change. But you can go from long term change of speciation to extremely long term change, evolution of all life on Earth. And that's one of the stories we're going to try and tell in the exhibits here in Waynesboro. Uh, I'll try and take some questions, but first I have to acknowledge these two gentlemen. Richard Hyten on the left at the University of Maryland. He's now retired, but he studied salamander evolution for decades, literally, in the eastern U.S., and the species trees that I was showing you are ones that he produced. Vincent Ferrallo is a younger PhD, a new Ph.D. from the, and now is at the University of Scranton. He has done um, a lot of work on ecology of these species, and all the range maps I showed you are ones that I found on one of his websites. Um, finally, the University of California Museum of Paleontology's website, excellent understanding evolution website, a lot of the cartoons of the people and the birds are ones that I got from that. So those were, that's the source of many of the graphics. And so now I'll try and take some questions. No questions. Oh, in the front. Uh, what is the general lifespan of a salamander? More than a year because they hibernate. But other than that, to be honest, I am not a salamander biologist. Does anybody else know? Oh, that's right. There are quite a few people who, that some of them live quite a long time, up to 15 years in captivity. And they go through metamorphosis? No, these ones don't. These ones are direct larval development. They don't require, they don't require fresh water to reproduce the way most amphibians do. 
Any other um, very unique to like Augusta County or this area, like creatures that are super unique? I know you said it was a hot spot, obviously, but um, can you give any examples? Um, there are probably millipedes that are unique. And those are, again, soil, uh, leaf litter organisms. There are no mammals that are unique, or I would have talked about them. <laughs> There's, there may be some subspecies of mice restricted to certain areas of Virginia, but full-blown species, different species. Um, there are probably hidden unique species that we haven't discovered yet because until Richard Hyden started using... Um, he used alizymes at, at the time, you know, kind of the cutting edge uh, uh, technique to get closer to actual DNA sequencing. Now we can sequence the entire genome of an organism, of an individual and species. But uh, back in the day, um, you looked at two things and you said there must be some DNA differences because this one's brown and this one's green. And now when you do DNA sequencing, you can see, yeah, those, those two that are different colors, um, there are some DNA differences, but this other one that's brown is actually a different species, and those two are the same. It's just uh, relative differences in DNA. But so until about 20 or 30 years ago, they only, there were only... Uh, there were many fewer than 55 species of plethodon recognized. And he only discovered these, uh, he in, in fact is the person who, who discovered and named the big level salamander because he had already discovered the Shenandoah salamander and he was looking for more of them. And instead he found a completely different species. So this is a more general question about speciation, and you explained it well that when there's a barrier that two species can develop, but when that barrier goes away, what prevents them from reproducing? What has happened in the interim that prevents them from so, being able to reproduce again? Um, more mutations have occurred than what I was able to show. <laughs> so um, mutations ac have accumulated to the point where so some animals have um, post-zygotic mechanisms that prevent them from reproduction, and the most kind of commonly, uh, one of the best examples is horses and donkeys produce mules, and horses and donkeys actually have different numbers of chromosomes, and so the mule gets an odd number of chromosomes, which makes most mules sterile. Not all mules are sterile. But it's an accumulation of, of differences over time that in, in the DNA that when they come to, when these animals come together, they're reproductively incompatible. You can't make a, uh, an offspring that can have DNA replicate and divide and produce eggs and sperm that are functional. That probably still didn't answer it, but... Well, I think so it's time dependent. To some extent, I mean, but for, I mean, some, there, there are, I don't have a, uh, a particular plant in mind, but I know some plants have polyploidy, where something happened in the in the uh, in reproduction, and instead of the instead of the chromosomes reducing in number the way they're supposed to, they just went through, and so you get a you get twice as many chromosomes in the offspring as they're supposed to have, and that if you if you think about it, that's like instantaneous speciation because it's possible that the offspring can't mate with either of the parents. It can only mate or can only reproduce with other uh, offspring that got that same complement of chromosomes. Yes, another question.
Um, endangered is actually sort of a, a regulatory definition by uh, uh, agencies that are stewards of biodiversity on behalf of the people. So I guess I would say that they are more, um, they are more imperiled by some huge natural disaster happening could wipe out the entire population of them. Like yes. Storm. Yes. Or, uh, or some, yeah. So newts and salamanders look so similar. Did they start, oh, sorry. Did they start together in the, um, and then separate over time? Newts? Yeah, newts and salamanders. Well, so newts are larval salamanders, right? That's what she's asking, are they? Oh, are, are well, newts, help someone who knows more about salamanders, Joe. <laughs> Aren't newts just a larval form of certain species and what, I, what I'm pretty sure is these guys do not have a larval form. They hatch from an egg and they're, they look like little adults and they just get bigger. They don't have a completely different life stage and metamorphose the way a lot of insects do. So Janet, I, I don't know uh, which part you're talking about, but the, the, the newt is the organism. The red F is that kind of orange thing we see crawling around the forest floor in the springtime, and it turns into kind of this more aquatic phase, right? So those are salamanders. They're, they're, they're the same species, different life phases. So they are very closely related to the organisms that Nancy's talking about, but in a different family. So they're kind of like cousins. You might want to think about it that way. So closely related, but you know, somewhat, uh, somewhat different uh, in terms of their evolutionary relationship. But they all kind of have, Nancy, I think we would be accurate to say they, they do have a very close common ancestor. Yes, because they're all salamanders. with like the Natural History Museum. Um, what is the likelihood of finding fossils on these like kind of hot spot areas? Since I mean, they're mostly developed by, you know, people doing walking trails and not actual homes. You know, so I'm just thinking that they're a little bit more on The chances of finding fossils? I just in general. I'm just curious. You know, so I, tend to be more, you know. Um, I honestly don't know. I'm just curious. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you would the, the guy who was here last month is the person to ask. <laughs> yeah. our, our, our curator for paleontology talked last month that he talked a little bit about where fossils can be found here in the valley. And, and that's available on hmm. the museum's uh, Facebook. Yeah, I think so. And I believe also the Wayne Theater's Facebook. 